Right, hey guys, how are we doing back under the video from Totally On Mark? Continuing with his reviews for One Piece. We are checking out the end of Wano. Quite interesting, the timing here. Like, I'm curious whether it... I don't want to be like, mm, but um, yeah, I'm sure the last chapter only came out yesterday at the time we were recording this, maybe the day before. But uh, hey-ho, um, going to be interested what he thinks of the ending. I thought the very last chapter, I quite liked how non-action-y it was and how fun it was and... It just, it was nice. Um, so, Yamato not being part of the crew is a bit annoying, and uh, Momo's moment was nice. But yeah, let's see what he thought of like the whole, you know, last end bit of of Wano. I've really enjoyed it. This video is brought to you by Express VPN. You guys might very well love me or hate me after watching this video. Yeah. So, what are we going to talk about? Hmm. Well, quite a lot actually. Like I said last week, the raid on Hanukashima, as well as the subsequent battle that takes place in Kaido fights so good. Then many arcs in this series and longer than most manga in publication ever get the chance to be. Mm -hmm. This is to say, Wano is an absolute beast. A it is. of an arc, has more fights than any other section of the story I've covered, and comes packaged with choices both visually and narratively that have fractured a fan base as loyal and diehard as they come. Hmm. That's where I come in. Hey, hey! <laughs> we finally conclude one on this week and nice. attempt to analyze and break down exactly what injected so much fun of our scene. Basically, I want to try and figure out what made this arc such a good one. At least from my perspective. Right. Was it a great arc? Was it as bad as many touted to be? Only one way oh, to find people it. complaining. Toy not mark, and these are my first what? Off, I really loved it. Review oh, this was boss. The conclusion to the longest arc and battle in One Piece history. Yo. Let's do it. Let's finish Onigashima. Okay, so I spent a large portion of last week's script sharing what I loved about the beginning of that raid, and Joy I can say it's true to my experience. I did like the vast majority of it, save for one or two key aspects I had issues with, which I did share last week also. But this week, we're diving into material I am far more mixed on, so let's try and tackle this. This is going to be an interesting one, yeah. And let's try to do it in some sort of cohesive order. Luffy ends up losing to Kaido in his first tango with yes. the great monster himself. Which is great. Falling from the roof and ultimately the now floating island of Onigashima all seems lost. Leaving Yamato then being tasked with holding back his own father. This is a very cool moment in the series and while the story very does pick up again, this cool. marks the beginning of a midpoint crawl for me. Waiting for Luffy. First yeah, off, let's yeah, clear I something get up. that. I am not saying nothing good comes from this choice to bench Luffy. Yeah, give everyone life. else a bit of an but opportunity, you know? Isn't affected by this sudden shocking negative news, yeah. but they keep fighting because they know what Luffy is made of. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, in a similar way to how I felt during Death Note's second half, where there was a compelling story to be told between near and light, but there's all this extra stuff in between. In between the middle and right. Okay, I see what you're saying. Yeah. Come together at the end to deliver the final finale, which is awesome. But that midpoint in that series is rough. That's sort of how I feel about Wano, at least in this particular section. And while this battle needs to have a bunch of different things happening all at once, when there's no movement on the main event and we're stuck in this obvious waiting period, I almost entirely lost interest until Luffy resurfaced. Oh, there wow. are plenty of interesting moments with Damn. plenty of potential, like Momo's addressing to those in battle and Sanji carrying around wounded Zoro. Is that was hilarious. hilarious. Yeah. Again, it all feels like padding to me. Now this isn't to say that when Luffy isn't on screen, I'm bored. Far from it. I love Luffy as a character, but it's important for other characters. Everyone to else needs to have moments. Without his story interrupting them. So that's not necessarily my issue. My issue is that the fight itself isn't even progressing in the background. We know as an audience that the main battle this arc is about is now on pause. We know they aren't suddenly. Ah, I get what he's saying. We are going to crash through. We are literally just waiting for Luffy to come back to finish it off. Yeah. The way everything's paced out, like laid out on the manga panels. A lot of dialogue. Hmm. 
because I don't find Oda's art interesting. Far from it. I love reading books and Oda's artwork is eccentric and fun. But Brilliant. both of these two things don't come together very well and made for some really tough reading sessions for me. With this approach, I think, fundamentally stripping One Piece of the gravitas it could otherwise have had if it was laid out more clearly. Mm. And I mean this in the most sincere and earnest of ways. So allow me to explain what I'm trying to say. Go. In filmmaking, animation, and even comic layouts, presentation is a monumentally important aspect in the creation process to consider. Whether you're writing a book or a script mm -hmm. for a film, the key visual elements need to be clear for the readers or viewers taking in any given scene. Well, you actually need to understand what's going on. To some extent. We need to know where characters are specifically, where they are in relation to one another, and in particularly within a battle, we need to know and understand the consequences of being in a specific location. Yes. Shows and stories are made and broken by this fundamental principle. Many thrive and many fall from grace potentially as a result. Game of Thrones has some terrific examples of both great Ooh. and terribly conveyed battles. This big brain time. Oh god, here we go. God, here we go. Oh this mate, this was sick. <laughs> never loses itself in the chaos and always keeps a clear track of the scene and the locations of any given Yeah, you always know what everyone's doing. Yeah, yeah, okay, go with me. With the goal clear in the minds of the characters and by association the viewers watching at home. The same can be said for season 6 episode 9's Battle of the Bastards. Mate, Battle of the Bastards is incredible. Playing host to one of the scrappiest, most chaotic battles in the series itself. Bro. And it's one of my favorites. Starting out as a psychological battle with one life in the balance. Well, his brother when he's running away, and then when they get circled, and it's like, oh. It indulges in this craziness just long enough to capture the essence of the fight itself, but never for so long that we lose track of what's going on in taking mm -hmm. place. And largely, this is true of One Piece's Onigashima towards the beginning, but One Piece keeps the craziness going for a very long time, and eventually, I got a little lost. Season 8, episode 3, entitled The Long Night, is one of a few episodes from Game of Thrones' final season that became married as time soldier. I didn't Both watch the last season because I just the refused to. With this battle is how difficult it is to see and how damn boring it was as a result. Huh. A battle built up for 8 seasons literally since episode 1, season 1, concluded in one dark, hard to see episode. Oh. Actually, however, One Piece doesn't have really? the same narrative problems. Far from it. But when it came to conveyance, I genuinely had no idea where different characters were, and in many instances, totally lost interest. I mean, there was a lot going on. I do get what he's saying here. It did get to a point where there was like so many side stories and characters introduced and people in different places. I know one of them by name, and despite Oda going out of his way to give them all unique personalities, I just didn't feel like I. Yeah, like he took the time to work on them. Good, the Yamato's not join the crew, which great. More characterization, flashbacks, and connection to the greater One Piece world than most of the characters introduced during the Wano, and maybe even most of the story. Yamato knows he can beat his father, but in the name of Odin, Yamato got to try. Of Kaido. This is pretty much the only fight during the middle section I had any interest in. Despite it, at times, sick. Quite it's sick. Out, one moment issuing the challenge to Kaido, then disappearing for chapters and chapters, only to resurface for the end of a chapter stinger as a zone fruit user. Again, it looks cool, but yo, yo, yo. this battle, a battle that I do very much like, it still feels like it's trying to stretch content for the sake of other less... Let's just keep it going, I suppose. But nah. less interesting to me. Once it does, however, show up and spend time exploring the character of Yamato, it becomes more engaging and interesting. Bearing witness to Yamato's fabled meeting with Ace was a wonderful way to introduce the character to the story, while also tying him to the aspects of the greater world right off the bat. From this point, immediately I was inclined to lean in and listen to this character's scenes because of the connection, and due to that I became much more attached to him quicker. Furthermore, while spread out, the battle Yamato takes part in against Kaido is once again filled with flashback sequences offering up another peek into their past together, like what detailing the yeah. torturing punishment Kaido would lay before Yamato, forcing starvation upon him for long extended periods oh, God, yeah. which makes it all the sweeter when the battle works in his favour. Hama, Jinbei, and Robin. Ah. It's a nice idea to help change the tide of battle utilizing Thomas' powers, but perhaps the best part of this downtime for me was the promise of something more foundational to this story being revealed. 
Not at all to do with Thomas Seen, unfortunately, but during Jimbei's battle with Who's Who, we learned something feverishly interesting. A former member of CP9, he was imprisoned for failing to guard oh, a certain fruit. And Shanks the stole the devil fruit. And ultimately, our little stretchy boy, Luffy. Yes. Immediately, this woke me up from the disinterest. Yeah, it's like, whoa, 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 story points. Sprinkled across a number of chapters is this illuminating conversation between these two concerning the origin of Luffy's gum gum fruit. And, of course, tell us of the sun god, Naturally, Mika. all of these components are connected, which I'll get into later, but for now, they were the only thing that kept me engaged when reading, and it's honestly very fascinating stuff. I love it when Oda does this stuff. Broadly speaking, it in, think this like with other side people, side people talking about it. It's like, yo, okay, what? Any other part of this manga. There's plenty to enjoy with Zeus and Nami staying true to her convictions, not running away, but there's so much dialogue in the layouts for this section, particularly in chapter 1018, are just awful for me to read. There's just so many panels, so many reactions, so much flavor text that I would normally greatly See, enjoy, it but found it bother me. With my interest waning, I like that there's a lot going on. Robin's fight, on the other hand, was a nice bit of respite once again. The narrative significance of Sanji asking for Robin's help and the small exchange she shares with Brooke before whipping out some awesome moves on one of the Toby Rappos was great. Very sick. Nika Robin, I love how capable she is, like, now. Like, she was anyway, but, like, she's got more confidence behind her being with the crew. this contest my favorite amongst the Toby Rappo battles. But enough of that bullshit. Time for Luffy's return. Let's go. Luffy's return. Let's I times <laughs> <laughs> it, but Momo's journey throughout this story has been nothing short of incredible. Yeah, and now that an absolutely cool ass man. The finale, this is where the tale starts to pick up steam once again, thankfully. And as I was reading this for the first time, when Luffy asked Momo to turn into a dragon and lift him up to the roof of Onigashima, I couldn't ask for a more perfect full circle moment for these two characters and the relationship to have. Having come out of a pit and punk hazard, having pushed him to become a man, now Momo finds himself assuming more responsibility than anyone has That's five Kaido. Begging to use the ripe ripe fruit to turn him into a fully grown man. Appropriate, I think, for this story. And I like how they left us to wait to see what he looked like for a while as well. That was just cool. Also, so perfectly laced with so much of this wonderful characterization this series is famous for. Luffy coaches the increasingly confident but still timid Momo into battle with Kaido, eventually cool. coaxing the now full grown man in dragon form to bite his back. With Luffy exclaiming, That's an emperor of the sea you just took a bite out of. Is there a single thing left in this world for you to be scared of? That's Hell yeah, reassurance, man. Simple yet insightful Luffy line of dialogue. Oh, man. Only Oda you can keep fight. doing this. With going on to proclaim, Don't worry about Kaido. I guarantee I'll win. As long as I'm alive, I'll have infinite chances. This sort of character writing is exactly the type of inspirational and uplifting stuff I read this series for. Yeah. Luffy's boundless confidence and conviction in his own abilities translate so powerfully in these moments, and Oda does a wonderful job of communicating that family aspect. Zoro and Sanji take on King and Queen. That was sick. Sanji and Zoro's dance with King and Queen was honestly a lot more engaging than I otherwise thought it would be. I suppose with the past 20 or so chapters not delivering enough to capture my attention, it's to be expected that's what my mind was at. However, a great story can win me over any time, and including core character moments for the likes of these two strong components of the Straw Hat Pirates was just what the Doctor ordered. Sanji's conflicting thoughts surrounding his usefulness to his captain and his body's full capabilities compromising his moral code was an interesting one to tackle for sure. Part of the reason I never anticipated I would enjoy this fight as much as I did was due to the fact that while Queen and maybe King were two of the more well-known underlings mm -hmm. of Kaido, I still didn't really feel any meaningful emotional connection to them. Queen was probably the one I had the biggest emotional response to due to his actions in Udon, but outside yeah. of that I felt it was lacking. However, Oda manages to circumvent this very issue by creating a living manifestation in Queen of everything Sanji rejected from his family. Oh yeah, because he was into the germ of technology and stuff, wasn't he? Yeah. Story. That was honestly a brilliant idea. And while I do have issues with how this page makes itself known on the pages of physical manga, I think online it makes for not only a tremendous finish, but a fantastic final panel in this compelling fight. Of the chapters concerning these two, however, I believe I found Zoro's oddly enough to be the most compelling, particularly in chapter 1033. Unlike many other strong. Oh, we learn stuff about King as well, don't we, and the much race that he's from. And that. A few words that allows his actions to speak for themselves. 
Because I feel like there has to be a reason that we've learned about this race. Kid came back and had stuff to do. Pretty sick, like. Chain in front to throw that it's like show that it's gone that way. Yonko for a reason. I mean, she was it. I mean, we still don't know. Is she dead? That's the interesting one. <laughs> I I think they are, but. Yo. He's not bothered. He's like, cool. I like, I'm like, gonna have a nice scrap in that, but come on. Yeah, this was like, what? Because CP now intervened. No one else could do it. No one else can do it. understood her and had the power to change her life for the better. She's told that he's died and Oda captures that feeling beautifully in this tragic reaction panel. I couldn't believe the intervening in that fight, man. Joy Boy. 
This was so weird. Luffy's Gear 5 was a form that gave me pause for a second. One that caused me to reflect upon the entire series and look at it perhaps in a new light. Now, communicating my complicated feelings surrounding this is going to be difficult without examples. And this so is interesting. I want to start this dissection of the form off by addressing what made one of my old favorites, the classic Super Saiyan form ah, okay. and transformation yes. from 1991. So popular and interesting I mean, yeah, it, it, around the world. It doesn't it have does that kind of hit. But we've had it hinted for a while and it was really cool to see it arrive. So what do I mean by that? Well, in the very instant Goku achieves this form, he becomes, in effect, the personification of pain, loss, and retribution in the series, echoing the themes of the arc and indeed the broader story as it stood then. Achieving a massive emotional and cultural effect around the world. Mm -hmm. This is all, of course, to say that while enjoying the surface level goodness that scene brandishes is okay, I think it's additionally important to consider the impact or thematic relevance this transformation or transformations like this offers the greater story a given character is undergoing. Naturally, it must look the part in order for it to be an effective marketing tool. However, if we decide to look past the gimmick and the capitalistic intent behind the design, narratively, there's a lot for us to either subconsciously or consciously latch onto here. Mm -hmm. Super Saiyan, as a form, comes from an individual reaching their breaking point. Yeah, it's like an emotional, like, and that's why you, when you see it happen, you're like, yo, alright, yeah, we go. It's born of frustration and rage, emotional. lashing out uncontrollably. Like trying to harness the power of the sun. And Joy Boy's like only for a moment, happy. Let's go crazy all over the place. Dramatically, it was a rebirth amid immense trauma, an instant change that allowed the user to walk a dangerously fine line and wield a necessary strength to vanquish a formidable evil. In the case of Goku, that evil was Frieza, and there's something unbelievably cathartic about that. Following the success of that watershed moment from manga and anime history, like any other trope that becomes popular, hundreds and hundreds of other new stories sprouted from that newly fertile soil, trying their best to, in good faith, emulate or straight up copy. The oh, I see what he's doing here. So, like, they did the opposite. Some innovated here. the idea and found tremendous success, while others didn't. However, now over 30 years later, it's easy to get lost in cliche expectations of what a transformation ought to be now. While Akira Toriyama tapped into a specific type of transformation through anger, the mechanism by which one transforms narratively is far less important than the narrative connection or story that I can't wait for Chainsaw Man to come out, man. Oh my god. This is, again, all to say that one doesn't need to channel anger to faithfully apply this narrative technique. In fact, you could, in theory, do the exact opposite mm -hmm. and see a similarly effective narrative result. And that's what which we brings did. Me to Monkey D. Luffy's now somewhat. Okay, I swear that's the last time. It is now somewhat controversial Gear 5 transformation. Discussing aspects of a character as old and as well-worn as Luffy is an intimidating task, at least for me. I've grown up with the likes of Goku and enjoy analyzing him for that very mm -hmm. reason. Despite my thoughts on certain aspects of the series and indeed the character not gelling with certain people or populations online, I at the very least know what their arguments are, which allows me to at least feel like I did my due diligence before I release a new video. With Luffy, I don't have that same security. Oh, don't keep so, showing this nearly this falling section, off thing. It really like froze me. Of the series to get a better idea oh, of stop it. And so the following <laughs> are fully synthesized thoughts like on the that. topic of Luffy's Gear 5 transformation. Despite anger being a powerful, albeit somewhat now socially safe, catalyst for modern shonen authors to grant their protagonists, any transformation Luffy's undergone through years has never, and I mean never, been about anger. Hmm. Each gear, of course, is wildly different and instantly memorable yes. in different ways, but ultimately, the common thread isn't anger, resentment, hatred, or any other comparably powerful negative emotion. Instead, it's quite simply his imagination. For the purposes of this argument, hmm. let's take a walk back through memory lane to what stands out to me as being significant with his development concerning the gear system. Let's start with gear two. Right. The very moment Luffy learned there was a trick to CP9 Soru or Shave, he used his own imagination to craft a method of equating their speed. It might have been demonstrated and unveiled to us during a moment of intense significance similar to other more traditional shonens, including Dragon Ball. Yeah. However, the impetus for the gear two technique being developed came from Luffy's ability to see what was possible and where he needed to be to match the competition. And every subsequent addition to his gear system followed suit. Using his imagination to manifest his own destiny, 
He wanted to punch harder and therefore created Beer 3. Right. Upon learning hockey from Raleigh, during the time skip, Luffy incorporated it into his fighting style and created a new Gear 4 capable of taming the beast he was training against. Combating Cracker, he utilized his own size to generate more defensive power. Yeah, and okay, this is interesting, I like this. to go faster and did so by way of Snake Man. Every single time Luffy's development eventually produces something new, they have always come from his own ability. Imagination and stuff, yeah. Using his imagination, cobbles together some solution from what he has available to him. And I think that's what's important here. It's not necessarily what he's responding to, but the fashion with which he responds to that thing. Right. This is all again to say that Luffy's gears, at least as far as I can see it, aren't simply a power-up for the sake of making him stronger. They're a full-on example of his ingenuity to create and shape his body to fit the scenario and find a way to win. And in these instances, the limit was always his imagination. The mm. more he learned, the broader his perspective grew and ultimately the more fantastical his transformations became. To me, that's what Gear 5 is. It's a fantastic and fantastical culmination of everything Luffy is and always has represented in the story. Freedom. Yeah. Echoing precisely. I like this. Alright, I'm on board. Way, way back that he wants to live freer than anyone. And the so Pirate more, King. Somewhat appropriate in my mind at least that there's a population of people online that refers to Gear 5 as quote to the force. And I say appropriate because... It's evocative of exactly the attributes that make imagination and the freedom to express and explore art so effective. I mean, what else broadens the scope of imagination more than cartoons? In yeah. Dragon Ball, Goku's sudden and abrupt transformation into the legendary Super Saiyan saw a once happy go lucky young man focused on light heartedly improving himself through martial arts shift violently into a monster. Yeah, then it's just stuck with that, I suppose, yeah. One that would aggressively bark at his own son to leave and one that would strike fear into the most terrifying entity the universe itself had ever seen. Goku and Luffy have been compared quite frequently and are similar in many important ways. However, one of their many foundational differences comes in how their stories have their personalities interact with the world. Hmm. Where Goku's story details his journey to surpass his personal limitations imposed by his own physical body time and again, Luffy specifically focuses on his ability to overcome limitations placed onto him by external forces, to brave the harsh and dangerous oceans that he himself can drown in, to broaden his horizons far beyond what modern man had ever seen, and to achieve true freedom no matter how dangerous it can be. And so, in the same way Super Saiyan represents Goku shattering his own previous physical limitations, this bombastic and fantastical Gear 5 form represents Luffy taking the freedom that he seeks for himself. Animation and comics, after all, have always pushed the boundaries of what is considered possible. And paying homage to that childlike wonder and joy is not only, I think, a brilliant move by Oda, but Definitely. one that roots the story once again in the type of character writing I praise throughout this ever-growing series of reviews. Encapsulating everything someone named Joy Boy should represent in the hearts and minds of society. Not only in the world of One Piece, but perhaps ours too. With it, in addition to that, heightening the thematic counterbalance between Luffy and Kaido to boot. I mean, to see this, you need look no further than this speech by Kaido himself. He says, Abilities alone cannot conquer the world, because only hockey can transcend all. Kaido himself has internalized hockey as the be-all and end-all end of everything. Yeah, it's just, one yeah. One foundationally built around the strength of one's own... So it doesn't matter what you can do with your devil fruit, you gotta be able to use hockey, man. He was the strongest... Even Goldie Roger didn't have a devil fruit. One should always bet on him. He conquers all. However, as Luffy has said many times in the past, he has never been, nor has he any intention of becoming a conqueror. He was never about that, quote, I'm not going to conquer anything. The one who is the most free is the pirate king. The moment Luffy becomes the freest is when, ha <laughs> you don't think I noticed, but I noticed, you sneaky bastards. The moment Luffy becomes the freest is when his willpower is truly capable of matching Kaido's. Now what does he say when he beats him? What does he say to defeat the mindset of the strongest in all the world who believes equality is based around physical strength? Well, Luffy wants to create, quote, a world where his friends can eat as much food as they want. Yeah. In a battle of wills on top of the world itself, Luffy is the personification of boundless freedom and compassion. Imagining a world that isn't just limited by his own enjoyment, but those of his friends. Of course Kaido was always going to win a 1v1 brawl, but the whole point of this battle, from the very beginning, was that it wasn't simply a 1v1 contest, a battle of brawn. Luffy had always been supported and buoyed by the people around him. He gained strength from them, and there's no greater example of that being the case 
this moment right here. If Luffy had done what so many other shonen protagonists had done and lashed out in a fit of traumatic rage against Kaido, surpassing his physical limits once again in order to overcome this monstrous individual, it would have, in my view, not only been massively bereft of any creativity or originality, but would have also been far less emotionally and narratively resonant with yeah, the rest with of the story Luffy is. that has been told up until now. Yeah. In the same way, Game of Thrones' as Ramsay Bolton was quoted by saying, I don't know, the, 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 the choppy off so of the bit of the bit. <laughs> the themes of his in his battle with Kaido through the very transformation mechanic popularized by Dragon Ball over 30 years ago. In response to the need he has to create a world for his friends to have enough food to eat, he imagines and manifests his own unique solution to that problem. And in the process of writing this, Oda himself managed to manifest a worthy modern interpretation of the classic shonen transformation popularized all those years ago. In my honest opinion, I think this transformation fits One Piece better than perhaps any other. And so, I don't think it would fit in in any other kind of like show either. Like it just could be fits in perfectly. Yeah. Transformation the One Piece series has ever seen, but that's just my take. Victory. Let's go. Luffy's ultimate defeat of Kaido is a simple yet brilliant one. Because of his reliance on the Straw Hat Pirates with their unwavering belief in, in their captain, he was able to, with their assistance, save one. Sorry, I keep recording these videos quite late. <laughs> Whereas, on the other hand, Kaido's ranks are full of dissension and betrayal through the likes of his so called alliances. All in all, I am very happy with the conclusion to this one. With the final speech to the people of the Flower Capital coming from the Go young ass. Heart, Kozuki Momo Momo looks so cool. His father's beliefs, the words his people needed to hear, and giving me shivers in the process. It was a spectacular speech, and furthermore, a terrific reveal of what he in fact looks like. I've speculated for quite a bit during my now very long series of reviews concerning this very arc itself, that once the dust does settle on Wano and the day is won, the world outside would be very, very different. Definitely. And I think it's really cool to see that they're making use of that device in the story. Well, yeah, I can't wait to see what's going on outside. Jesus. Sabo, what have you done? Green ball. Mental. Will you be in a freaking Yonko? So sick. But the Pluton was kind of cool too. Like, seriously, I don't think I would have guessed that about one or hundreds of years ago hmm. if I had a hundred years to think about it. But it being underwater in this weird bowl shape, that's just, it's just kind of a cool idea. It is cool. Fun visual. But now that we're moving into what can only be described as the end game of One Piece, with Shanks making his move for the grand Let's go for the war base. Like, ah! Uh... Sail with Yamato and Toa as his new crewmate. <laughs> ah, right, okay. <laughs> Seen it. <laughs> yeah. And I think my experience cool. with Wano has been brilliant overall. Despite the midpoint of the raid itself being extremely slow and dry, in my opinion, with paneling that Nico Robin would have trouble deciphering. And maybe, maybe that was a bit too. Was that too far? Oof. I genuinely had a very good time reading this arc over the last couple of years. Like, yeah. You know, safe been really safe, good. I've been a fan of this series for years. How crazy is that? A year and a bit I for me. Like to see how this one ends, but until then, I've been totally not Mark. I'll see you all next time, and thank you all so much for watching. That was fun. It's been fun checking these out as we're reading it. Living in this house, it's been, it's been great. What's it doing? Oh, because we're on the final story now. It's going to be interesting to see how Mark paces out the reviews for One Piece as it goes on, but, um... Yeah, I've really, really enjoyed checking out these reviews from Mark as I've been reading it, and I'm glad that he covered that. And fit in that last bit at the end. Yamato's joining the crew. <laughs> but, um, yeah. Uh, I really enjoyed Wano, and um, if you want to see me give a little bit of a kind of quick blurb on the chapters as they come out, I do that every week on my TikTok channel, which I don't know how to link. So if you just search for me, Pixel Podcast on TikTok, uh, every week as a as the chapters come out, I literally just give like a sixty second talk over what I think about the chapter. Nothing too in depth, just fun, you know. So um, but anyway, thank you to my patrons. If you want to have your name at the end of every video, upload a link to the description of the Patreon page. One dollar a month is all that helps for the channel. It's greatly appreciated. Thank you guys very much for that. And thank you all for watching. What did you guys think of that? What did you guys think of this? Click like, subscribe, and leave comments below. Let me know what I should watch, watch and discuss in future videos. I'll see you guys, all you guys, next time.
Bah.